Welcome. Again, it's a pleasure to be here with this, e this evening, and I so look forward to this talk. It's called The Law of Dissipative Structures. Does that mean anything to anybody? Good. Okay. It will by the time we're done. And it's really about love and fear and healing. So I'd like to begin this um, talk with a moment of prayer, if you'll join me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful that we can come together to understand what you would have us understand about healing. You alone heal. Lord, let your message of healing become clear. Let us understand how you heal and what you've asked of us to cooperate with you in this process of healing. For this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So one thing I hear from patients often is, okay, here's what's going on. How much is it going to cost and how long will it take? My response is right. <laughs> when people are in pain or in fear, how fast do you want to get out of pain and fear? Right. How long did it take you to get into pain and fear? Years to decades. So there's a process by which we emerge from that. And what casts out fear? Perfect love. Whose love is that? God's love. We're going to look at this theme. Now, I'm going to give you a few introductory concepts. So I'm going to talk about health and wellness. You can see what that actually means. And the law of dissipative structures. Now, do you know what a dissipative structure is? Any structure that gets rid of garbage. Your body is a dissipative structure, hopefully. Everything in creation, in a sin-filled creation, is a dip dissipative structure. It accumulates garbage and has to get rid of it. So when I started studying this, I started realizing we're talking about a world of sin. Now, how it works. This is not how God designed it. I don't know how God designed it. I, I, we don't have much record of that. But it was perfect. And there wasn't garbage. There wasn't dung, as it's called. I so look forward to understanding the physiology of a glorified body. I, I look forward to living that physiology. So we're going to talk about that and healing, wholeness, and salvation in Christ, as we talked about as a theme already. Now, most people define health as what? When you say you're healthy, what does that usually mean to you? It's the absence of signs and symptoms. You're not hurting. The doctor says, look, you're fine. All the labs look good, and you're not hurting. You're not in pain. Now, I'm going to point out in a, mo in a moment what they look at when they say that. So disease, injury, is typically associated with certain signs and symptoms. Now, symptoms is something you experience. Signs is something somebody notices, notices about you. So you can have a sign of a high temperature. You can feel hot, but you can have a sign of 101 fever or high calcium or high blood pressure or whatever. Those are signs. Those are something that you indicate that someone else can read about you. But symptoms is something you tell someone else about your own experience. So there's a difference between health and disease in terms of symptom pictures. But there's something else I want to focus on, and that's called wellness. It's about optimizing physiology. I'm going to talk to you about what that means. So it looks like this. You've heard of the bell-shaped curve? All, all things in nature work according to bell-shaped curve, a distribution of possibilities. So when we talk about health, the bell-shaped curve in statistics is also called the normal distribution. Have you heard that word before? You've heard the word normal? That's where it comes from. It's not a medical term, it's a statistical term. And I had to study this in college as an engineer. We called the normal distribution. We learned a lot about it and how to deal with it. And then when I started studying medicine, I thought, they plagiarized this. But they didn't tell you where it came from. They said normal is okay. If you're normal, that's acceptable. Now let me tell you what normal actually means. So if you look at that middle curve, it's called the normal curve, you go out what are called two standard deviations from the normal, and that's called where you need to live. That's where most of nature lives. So if you're normal, you're as sick as 95% of the population. Did you hear that? That's what normal means, technically. 
If you're abnormal, you're at the at two and a half percent on either end. So when you look at lab data, they say, well, you're not abnormal yet, or you're not enough abnormal for us to know what to do. Meaning, you're not defining a disease condition where we have a drug to treat you yet, so come back when you're sicker. I'm not exaggerating. I studied this stuff. And I hear it from patients all the time. They say, yep, that's exactly what my doctor told me. I said, let me see your labs. So I'm gonna, I said, I'm gonna go over these labs with you in two ways. The way you've been told by your MD and the way I'm gonna tell you now as an ND, a naturopath. So I'm gonna look at it not from a normal perspective strictly, but from an optimal perspective, which is a much finer range that we understand from research about what labs need to look like to optimize physiology. So I say, all right, let me see the labs. You know how long it takes me to determine what's going on from a medical perspective, looking at normals and abnormals? About three minutes. How much time do you spend with an MD when you're going in to get an exam evaluation done? Three to five minutes. That's all it takes. I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. And I have great, res great respect for that profession when it's appropriate. I've referred people to MDs for other evaluations that I need that I can't provide. I'm not going to scope them. I'm not going to take visual images of them. I want that information that I can further evaluate what's going on. And when it comes to acute care, great. But when it comes to chronic care, it's a different world. So in reviewing information, literally it's three to five minutes, we're done. We know what to do, what the drug is, I'll see you in a month. Then I tell my patients, okay, now we're going to look at it from an optimal perspective. An hour later, we have an understanding of why things are the way they are. If I can't address the question of why you're experiencing what you're experiencing, then I don't understand what's happening. And I don't know what to do. So we keep digging until we can understand why things are the way they are. Same in the Bible, by the way. Unless we understand why the Lord told us what he did, we don't understand it yet. This is key. So, the abnormal picture, as I said, 5% total, so 2.5% on either end. Normal is 95% of the population. That's how sick the population is. And incidentally, there are certain lab parameters that are not even acknowledged in the normal concept because concept, the population is too sick, notably cholesterol and blood sugar. Cholesterol is so high in the, in the normal population that the, most researchers realize that if you're normal, you're very ill. So they skewed it down to say, okay, well, at least we can live with this. But the optimal levels are still lower than that. In fact, in the Framingham study, which has started the year I was hatched in 1948, and I'm not that old, in case you're counting, the study has demonstrated that if you have a total cholesterol of 150 or less, with an LDL cholesterol of 80 or less, you'll never suffer a terminal heart condition. Did you catch that? All right, that's much lower than normal. It's optimal. Same thing with blood sugar. Blood sugars in this culture have gone way high. Same with uric acid, leading to gout. I've watched these numbers over the decades change as the population gets sicker. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Why is now a uric acid of 7.5 normal before it was gout? Now it's normal. Because 95% of the population encompasses that. It's not desirable. It's certainly not optimal. It is going to be symptomatic, classically. The liver is very damaged. You're eating a bad diet of things that drive up uric acid, like red meat and peanuts and pistachios and sugar, as examples, to drive up uric acid. But the liver is a problem. So... But no one's looking at that. They're just saying, well, you're still normal. And if it goes abnormal, we're going to give you a drug to bring it down. We don't care why it's high. We're just going to do something to bring it in the other direction. Then that optimal level is something entirely different. When you start looking at optimal physiology, then you start thinking about, okay, why is the body expressing the way it is? What organs are breaking down? To what extent are they breaking down? And what does it take to regenerate health in those organs and in the system? And when Sister White gave us the eight laws of health, they are profound, as we'll start to go over. Now, healing is not 
the forced or artificial removal of signs and symptoms. Full stop. That has nothing to do with healing. It's not artificially trying to reduce a symptom. It's not giving you a drug to bring the blood pressure down or up. It's not giving you a drug to get the temperature down or up. It's not giving you something from the outside to change something on the inside by force. Satan's ways involve two things, and this is very strong language I'm going to use with you. He uses force and deception. Coercion and deception. Would you agree with that? It's called sorcery. Sorcery uses force and deception. It forces something into the body against the body's preferred will, and it deceives the body to think it's actually improving it. So when drugs are made, and I've read tons of research about all of this, when drugs are made, it's assuming a linear body, that you, you're going to affect a change here by starting something with a drug here, and you're going to go step A to B to C to D, and now it's going to make the change you want. Here's the fallacy. The body is a nonlinear system. It's not a linear system. So A is a set of possibilities, so is B, so is C, so is D. So you do something on this side, a drug, for example, and there are other ways of doing this as well. Have you ever demanded somebody do things the way you want? You're being a drug. You're using force, or coercion, and deception. You're making them think this is what they want too. It may not be in their best interest. It's not just drugs. It's input. So you're wanting an outcome, but the body doesn't go that way. It's going to go, well, this is a set of possibilities, and now here's another set of possibilities, and another, another. You don't know what to expect at the other side if you're assuming a linear direction of what must the outcome be. It doesn't work that way. So then you have what are called side effects. Side effects. That's right. They're not side effects. They're sets of possibilities of a drug in a nonlinear system. That's what happens. So I read through so-called side effect lists with my patients when they're on medication, and I say, all right, this and 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 this are possibilities. Yep, that's what I've got. Stop the drug. Let's find out what's going on to not require that. I see this day in and day out of my practice. So, healing is the natural process of improving and optimizing physiology and tissue integrity. Did you catch that? Healing is the natural process of improving our physiology and optimizing our physiology and the integrity of our tissues and organs and systems. Now, it's also the natural process of improving our character and our relationships. That's called healing. You ever had a broken relationship? Are you older than 15? <laughs> Who hasn't? Okay. Have you ever contributed to a broken relationship? We're all card-carrying members. No one's immune. I call my life empathy training. I get to empathize with my patients. I get what they've gone through because I've been there. You name it, it's bad. Been there. Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I have great empathy with that statement. I get that. So healing is improving not just our bodies, but our very character, our being, and our quality of relationships. The Lord has blessed me with an awesome relationship, finally and mercifully the angel I got to marry. I'm extremely grateful. Remember, angels can't say they are, so I understand. <laughs> now, healing leads not only to resolution of disease, but also to increased energy. Have you ever been tired? A lot? Where you can't get up in the morning, and you have no energy to do what you want to do during the day, and you've lost motivation and purpose and direction? You improve sleep. Oh. Remember I said the number one symptom I deal with in practice is insomnia or poor sleep. People can't get to sleep, they can't stay asleep, they can't wake up. They get to sleep at 7 in the morning. They start to bed at midnight or 1 or 2 in the morning because they can't begin to sleep before then. They wake up at noon or 1 or 2 and I'm not exaggerating. Or they have nighttime jobs. I work with firemen and people that pilot um, tugboats and things like that or nurses that are up all night in night shifts, graveyard, it wreaks havoc with their adrenals in their brain. 
because our cycles are completely backwards. Also, healing leads to reduce, reduction of pain and inflammation. Now, inflammation is behind every disease, including cancer. Inflammation creates scar tissue. Scar tissue causes things to bind and tighten. You ever had tight muscles for a long time? They're inflamed. Now, you know what happens when you inflame the vascular system? Like from COVID, for example, whatever you think that is, I'll leave it alone, but it's causing inflammation in the cardiovascular system. It's laying down scar tissue. Sugar does the same thing. Bad foods do the same thing. Stress does the same thing. And when you lay down scar tissue in the vascular system, guess what happens? Inside of the lining of the, of the vascular system is called the endothelial lining. Endothelial lining has to be clear of scar tissue for oxygen and nutrients to go across the membrane into the cell as tissue fluid into the cell and then as lymph taken back and circulated through the blood. But watch what happens. It takes two seconds for oxygen to go across the cell membrane and the vascular system to get to the tissues. Two seconds. If you lay down one micron of scar tissue, do you know how long it takes that oxygen to diffuse across the membrane? 5.3 minutes. Did you catch that? From two seconds to 5.3 minutes. What do you think happens to the cells when they can't get oxygen? They die, hypoxia. What happens to the brain when you can't get oxygen? It dies. What happens to the heart when you can't get oxygen? It dies. We're going through a slow death of hypoxia from inflammation. Inflammation is a huge issue. But healthy, health leads also to healthy relationships with one another, with ourselves, and most of all, with whom? With God. Amen. Now, there's one thing I find consistently in my patients. When they change their diet, they change their nutrition, they change their style of life, they start exercising, they start sleeping, they start following the basic laws of health, the conversation begins to change over the ensuing months, and it begins to move toward wanting to know God. I can't tell you how many times in my practice I bring out the Bible and we start studying the Bible. And patients wait for me. They know they'll get their turn. And I'm going to give them my full attention, but they know something's going on important with the patient they're, ha they're having to wait on. Because I get so excited about wanting to share the gospel with my patients. And they get excited when they hear the gospel. But they start wanting to know who Christ is, who God is, as their brains recover and the inflammation starts to go down and they want to know more and more about truth. It's a natural consequence of healing. I see this routinely in practice. It also improves overall well-being. That's an understatement. Now, this is from Ellen White and I love this comment. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. This one, I knew she was a prophet, Ministry of Healing. I thought, who knew this when this was written? This is foundational to naturopathic medicine, but it didn't exist in her day. She brought it from the Lord. Praise God. Do you know that you have a message right from the Lord, from the throne of God, about healing? No, no, no. Do you know you have a message from the throne of God by a prophet about healing? Do you know that that message was intended for the world? Do you know we dropped it in 1910 when we went away from naturopathic medicine to allopathic medicine and MDs? For what purpose? Pride and money was greed. Oh, do you know who took up the message? The New Age and Mystic World. I spent 30 years in that world studying this and the Lord plucked me as a brand from the fire and brought me to him. Now it's my deep yearning to bring that message to its original roots within the Advent movement and the gospel and connect health and the gospel. Do you understand that? Please understand it. You are medical missionaries. Each one of you is a medical missionary in the Advent movement. The Lord's asked each one of you to understand healing, to live that message so you can teach that message. You can't teach what you don't live. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite. Stop smoking. Right. 
give me a break. Okay? Stop eating sugar as you open up Hostess Twinkies or whatever they are. Okay? No. Live the message you want to teach. If you can't live it, don't speak. Instead, stop eating garbage. Start eating real food. Get with it. <laughs> with the health message. Study it. Make it part of your life. Don't be afraid to exercise. Get fresh air, water, sunshine. Do the things that we know to do. Make it a part of your life. Don't say, well, I'll start tomorrow. Manana. Too late. You have that inclination, that understanding. Just simply start. I tell my patients, walk half a block. And don't hitchhike home. Okay? Walk around the house from the back door to the front door. Just start. Now, she says also, restorative power is not in drugs, but in nature. Where do we look? In what the Lord has created. And I love this statement. Nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel what? Impurities or garbage and to reestablish right conditions in the system. Nature is to be assisted. Now, here's what I've seen in practice. When a person makes a decision to heal, Immediately, they start detoxing. The body goes, oh, good, finally. And they go, how can this happen so fast? I said, because you made the decision. You made the decision. And once you have that decision made, and your will is now in line with the will of God, that you be healed, the body immediately begins to respond. So don't be surprised. Be grateful. Nature's process of healing and building is gradual. Whoa. <laughs> How long is it going to take? As long as it takes. I tell my patients, I've seen people start noise, noticing changes in a day or two or a week. The longest is about four months. I'm going to hold your hand the entire way. You're not doing this alone. The Lord is with me. I'm going to support you. Do that with people you know and love. I can't tell you how many patients that are now vegan in plant-based diets whose family are now patients of mine, and I say, awesome, you have a, an incredible support staff or support team in your own family or friends of yours. They'll teach you how to make changes because they've been through it themselves. Have you ever had that experience? Good. One hand is awesome. I want the rest of you to raise your hand in a, in a month. Two hands. Do I hear three? Okay, So you want to start making changes that others can say, I want what you have. I can see what it's done for you. I want to do that for me. So it's gradual. The upbuilding is gradual, and the impatient, it, to the impatient, it seems slow. It seems like it's taking forever. When I started this process in myself, I was about 21, 22. I was super sick as a kid all the time. Earaches, gut problems, uh, forget, you know, it, gruesomeness doesn't matter. I had lots of problems as a kid, and I was raised on a diet that was, I forgave my parents for trying to kill me, okay? <laughs> Dad would put sugar in my milk, and I was allergic to both, okay? Egg sandwiches every morning on toast. I couldn't take either one. Lamb in the Middle Eastern culture is common. It was killing me. So when I turned 22, I became vegan, in the, in, at, uh, at Stanford. We were doing research on, on robotics, and I was working on a knee joint. We were doing the first robotics knee joint. I'd go to the, the section lab in medical school at Stanford, and I'd work on these cadavers, getting ready for the experiments we were doing, and I came back to the dorm to eat one night, and they served me exactly what I'd been working on. I'm done. I quit. Then I was in the Army after college, and I was doing KP. <laughs> We were cracking eggs for breakfast for the GIs and for my fellow army people. And it was during Vietnam. It was called a joke. So I was cracking eggs for them, and I looked down, and one was hemorrhaged. I looked, and I thought, I'm done. This is a live being. Why do I want to put that in my body? It's a fertilized ovum. I'm done. I became vegan in the army. You know, it's like being vegan in the army. You make deals with the cooks. You did okay. 
So it's slow. I began this process in my own body slowly. I began to read. And I studied the works of the natural hygienic movement, which came from Kellogg. No one ever mentioned Sister White. Not until I read Ministry of Healing and Council on Diet Food did I realize where this came from, from God. I said, praise you, Lord, that you've led me through this process. You prevented me from being a neurosurgeon and led me into naturopathic medicine and chiropractic. Praise your holy name that I can focus on healing, on true healing. So it was slow. I went through lots of detoxing. I experimented on my own body the hard way. We didn't know what we were doing. And we're living proof. <laughs> At that time, we had no clue what we were doing. Things were coming out of everywhere. We tried all kinds of approaches to cleansing, and they were effective. It was just hardcore. We've learned humane ways since then to support my patients. She said, in the end, it will be found that nature untrammeled, untrammeled, don't trample on it, does her work wisely and well. Allow it to occur. We've learned an immense amount in the world of natural health care to allow the body to recover, not to force it, but to allow it. How long will it take? <laughs> as long as is required. Give it time. My patients say, well, OK, in retrospect, there was a learning curve of six weeks to 12 weeks to change the pantry, to change the freezer, to change the fridge, to change the shopping habits, to change recipes and menus and meal plans and tastes, as Rhonda said earlier today. My touchstone was always avocado. Do you love the taste of avocado? I can't stand it. Three months later, I love avocado. Because they cleaned their taste buds, they stopped the garbage that was masking the flavor of avocado, as an example. Now, the law of dissipative structures. I want to look at this with you. I love this system. Dr. Ilya Prigogine got a Nobel Prize in 1977 in chemistry for developing this law. It was a law of dissipative structures. It's how systems that dissipate garbage change over time predictably. And I went to meet him in his office in Brussels, Belgium in the mid-90s. And he was willing to, to talk to me for an hour, which is awesome. And he was asking me questions. I'm going, right. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I had a lot of questions of him. But he had never heard his work applied to healing or health care. So he was curious to know what we were doing with his research. So I'm going to show you what we found. I'm going to lay it out for you carefully, uh, as carefully as I know how. So I have two axes here. One is how efficiently we adapt on, the, on this curve. And on this axis is time over our lifetime. How efficiently do we adapt in our lifetime? Now, are you effective adapters? Can you adapt to anything easily? You know that was a trick question, right? <laughs> so it depends. So we go through phases. So the first phase is at what we call a flow stage. You're at some functionality, wherever you are, and you don't notice anything changing. Then you start to accumulate garbage during that time. You're a dissipative structure. You're a garbage collector in your own bodies. You have natural accumulation of garbage by end products of metabolism and things that we eat that we have to get rid of, even in our cells. So the cell accumulates garbage over time. Then it has to dump that garbage. So we go through this flow stage followed by a dump. Then we dump garbage out of our cells. Then we either jump or slump, I call it. These are my own words. I don't, don't put them on Prigogine, that was, that was, these are my fault. But I want to make it simple for my patients to understand. And when we teach this, I want people to get it. So either you increase in adaptive efficiency or you decrease in adaptive deficiency after this, or efficiency after this dumping process. Now, what determines which way you go? That point of shift is called a demarcation point or a bifurcation. You're going to go either up or down. You're not going to stay same. Complacency is not allowed in nature. You know that? It's not allowed in your body. You cannot be complacent. You're either going to increase or decrease in adaptive capacity. You're going to get sicker or healthier. You can't ever stay just the same, as hard as you try. So after that shift, you're going to also go to a state of flow. 
You're going to go through another accumulation of garbage, dump that garbage, and then increase in efficiency or decrease in efficiency. And it continues from that way, on and on and on, to either increasing health or decreasing health and increasing disease. That's the progression. Now, watch what happens. You're going to jump or slump, but why? Uh, let me go here. Let's do it this way. The life you live during the time of one phase change to another phase change, from the time of flow to dumping to jumping or slumping. If you know what I mean when I say that now? Anybody? Okay, good. So you're on a state of st steady state, you're doing okay, and then you don't feel so good for a while, and then you feel great or much worse. I see this routinely in my own bodies and in practice. For example, you ever worked out pumping iron or doing cardio or whatever, and you feel great for a while, and then you go, what happened? I'm exhausted. I'm weaker. I can't do this. But you, you keep it up. You sustain it. And one day you go, whoa, this is much, much better. Or you give up for a while, and you start again. You go, whoa, <laughs> why did I ever quit? All right, it's like starting all over again. I've been on both sides of that. Or you eat well, and you feel fantastic. And then you reward yourself with a cupcake or a cup of coffee or the worst of the worst, ice cream. Lord help you. Okay? Or a chocolate cookie. Remember, remember last night I talked about steel-toed steel -toed shoes? I hope you're wearing them because we're going to talk very straight. Hopefully you don't need steel-toed shoes. So when you're in this process and you're eating well, Reward yourself with doing better, not with garbage. Because as soon as you start that process of rewarding yourself, your body's got a physiologic, biochemical memory of going, oh, I know what to do with that. I'm going to have more. And the more you have, the worse you get. And the next time you re reach that bifurcation point, are you going to jump or slump? Slump. You're going to get worse. So you're going to go toward either increasing health or increasing disease. Now, I don't need to. So we flow at times in our life without attention getting symptoms. In other words, you're just, you're doing okay. I'm not hurting, I'm okay. But the choices we make in our lifestyle and our habits determine what happens next in the phase of life. So we either dump and then go up or down. Can you see that? Okay. Let's go here. So we dump to dissipate the garbage or the residue and toxic waste that we don't need anymore. But there's also another way of dumping. Garbage that's in the way of our relationships. You ever held on to stuff in your relationships that don't serve you? Like revenge, grudging, hurt feelings, feeling bad? Did Christ ever contend for his rights? Not once. Was he touched in a way that he would feel bad about things we've done and take it personally on himself? Let me, let me language that a little differently. He was touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but he did not take on our strategies. Okay? Our relational strategies are basically to win or get back at someone or to be a victim. Those are common strategies. They don't work. So we hold on to stuff and hurts, but if we were dead to self, we wouldn't even notice those things existing. We wouldn't take things personally. It wouldn't be noticed by us. So when people were mean and nasty and reviling Christ, did he revile back? Never. That's our example. He was dead to himself and live in his father, fully obedient to his father. Do we want to be that way in Christ? Amen. If I adhere to Christ, I'm holding on to Christ, and someone sends something to me that in my previous existence, and the old man, as, he, as Paul calls it, I would react and take it personally or want to get back at them, God forbid, what's my option? Prayer. Cling to Christ. Saying, Lord, let you be seen now. 
Let me know them with your compassionate heart and respond your way, not mine. So we can dump things that don't serve us relationally at all. So we dump end products of metabolism, water-soluble toxins, fat-soluble toxins, anger, resentment, hatred, retaliation, gossip, envy. You ever seen gossip be ruin a church and a family? Guaranteed. Envy, pride, self-abasement, which is false pride, blame, self-defense, self-righteousness, lust, greed, gluttony, depression, anxiety, guilt. We, we know these too well. They don't serve us any longer. They're garbage worth dumping. Where do you dump them to? Who paid the price for those? Jesus, come to the cross. Saying, Lord, I've sinned against you and against the ones I profess to love, or even profess to hate, but I've sinned against them. Forgive me, Lord. Let me receive your righteous life. You've conquered all of this in my flesh. Now, when did Jesus conquer this in our flesh? 2,000 years ago. How is he conquering in our flesh today? His very presence is in us today, doing the same thing he did in our human flesh 2,000 years ago he's doing today in each one of you. The same work. Let him. Invite him in. Notice it. Be grateful. Keep your attention focused on him. Continually. Paul calls it continual prayer. Prayer is your, connect, your connection and conversation with the Lord continually. Keep that in your mind as a conversation continually. Let it mold your conduct continually. Now, let me go to one other thing here. All right. So when we jump, we jump to a higher level of function or we slump to a lower level of function at different forks in the road. And guess how many forks in the road there will be in your lifetime? Many. You can't just do this once and for all. There's forks in the road through our entire lifetime. We're always focused, we're always confronted with things requiring change in us. Don't hold on to stuff. If you do, you prevent further growth. Now, I want to show you one other thing here. Let me go past this. So where does this all lead over our lifetime? Depends on the choices we make. And the choices to live continually. Now, let me just do this. All right. Um, I want to go to one other place here. All right, I'm going to look at this with you. There's two drivers uh, to this process. When my patients come in and they're wanting help, what do you think drives them to the office? That's right. Pain, suffering, and fear. The two great drivers. And everyone acknowledges that and identifies with that. But there's another driver. What's that? Pardon? Love. Love. Can you imagine love being the motivator behind your actions? Not pain and fear? Most people are driven by pain and fear to get away from something. So you're running from something. What I try to help my patients understand is what you're running toward. Be motivated by what you're running toward. Love, the love of God. That, that express, that's expressed through you and in you. That's healing. It's salvational. So most people run away from something wanting to get away from pain for obvious reasons. And it's biologic as well. And fear. No one wants to live in that state. Now why do you think governments in the world continually keep people in fear? If you're in constant fear, what happens? You lose what did Rhonda talk about earlier today? Faith. Fear destroys faith. When those disciples were in the boat rowing across the lake and the wind came up, what did Christ say? Why are you afraid? O ye of little 
Faith. Faith and fear. Opposite. Fear destroys faith. Faith in the Lord and his love overcomes fear. Why? Because we look to Jesus, not to ourselves. Why were the disciples facing fear? Who are they looking at? Each other and themselves. What did they see? Dejection, despondence, hopelessness. Until they realized, oh, wait a minute, someone's in the boat with us. Jesus. And I said, a flash of lightning came and they noticed, oh, he's sleeping on the bow of the boat, in the back of the boat. And they said, Master, Master, help. <laughs> How come you don't care about us that we're going to die? Peace. Be still. Now, I've often thought about that. When Christ calmed the waters and walked on water, and he can do things he said we will be able to do even greater, meaning greater influence. Can you imagine walking on water and still in the bill is of the storm? That's not a rhetorical question, by the way. Jesus did that. He's our example. My brain goes tilt when I think about that. I go, Lord, let me just stay focused on you. I, I, beyond that, I'm speechless. I have no clue. I don't trust myself one iota. But Lord, I trust you. And use me however you deem fit. I'm content. Slay me, kill me, martyr me, let me live to be one of the 144,000. Whatever serves you, I'm content, Lord. Use me. Be beyond that, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I don't care what men think of me, what they do, what they don't do. I'm here to serve my fellow man and the Lord. Now, so when we look at the drive of love, it's going to always move us toward increasing health. When we look at the drive of fear and pain, and that's our focus, it's going to keep us sunk in that same morass or bog. Now I'm going to go past here. Uh, here it is. Okay. Now, there are two limits to this process of recovery, typically. Typically. Pain, fear, and disease on one end, and complacency on the other. What do I mean by complacency? I'm feeling good enough. I'm fine, just the way I am. I'm not hurting. I can finally sleep. I've got the energy I want. Um, I'm strong. I'm vigorous. I'm vital. I can now sit back and not have to keep in that, in that same direction. It's like praying once and for all. Not going to happen. So... The upper limit is complacency. The lower limit is personal discomfort or fear or pain. So what we find in this realm is a potential toward increasing wellness or a potential toward increasing disease. However, there's limits on either side of that, typically. Upper limit, complacency. Lower limit, fear. Now here's what typically happens, and I see this routinely in practice all the time. People go, oh my, I feel great now. The symptoms are gone. I'm not in pain anymore. I'm not inflamed. My gut doesn't hurt anymore. I can digest food. I can have a normal bowel function. I can sleep. By the way, the two questions I always ask patients is bowel function and sleep. Cut to the chase. If those are fine, we're a long way in the road of healing, truly. You can digest. You can assimilate. You can take in nutrients. And you can rest and recover. It gets easier from there. So they go, I can do all these things. I'm fine. I don't have to keep it up. Again, they reward themselves with something they know not to do. And the worst is with cancer. I'm going to give you a postscript to something Rhonda told you. Is that okay, Rhonda? We work with a lot of oncology cases, on, with cancer cases, have all my career. And I tell them always, the diet and lifestyle that got you sick will get you sick again or kill you. The diet and lifestyle that gets you well will keep you well and sustain you. Don't go back to what you used to do. It will kill you, especially with cancer. People with cancer will always have cancer. They say, well, it got cut out, I'm fine. No, you have a cancer physiology, a cancer biochemistry, a cancer genetics. Remember that, you always have cancer. You can't be complacent or it will kill you. So how many people have cancer, get it cut out, and five, 10 years later, it's back and they're, and they're dead? 
No problem. It's right on cue. Okay. <laughs> so we had this patient come in. He came to my office, and he had a swollen leg. He said, Doc, I've got phlebitis. I said, okay, let's examine you. I checked him. I said, no, you don't have phlebitis. I checked him for I said, you have a major swollen node in your groin on both sides. You have cancer. He said, oh, by the way, I have prostate cancer. I said, thank you for telling me. He knew that. He didn't want to admit it. So we got busy working with him, and he came up to the ranch. His son drove him in the back of his van because he couldn't walk. After several weeks, he was running three and five miles. The swelling in his legs was completely gone. The tumors reduced by, by 60%. They were only 40% the original size. He was on his way to recovery. I said, please, 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 I plead with you. Sustain the style of life that you've learned here. Do not go back. It will kill you. Do you know what happened? He died six months later. He went back home to his girlfriend. They had alcohol together. He went right back into the old lifestyle. I said, please, you cannot do that. I pled with him. He says, Doc, I'm sorry. I can't not do it. It killed him within six months. Now, the other, the other extreme, is, extreme is this. This lady that Rhonda told you about, she came in and she was referred by some other patients of mine with this abdominal aorta. It was called a liposarcoma. And it was inoperable. And it was killing her. It was around the abdominal aorta and it was literally compressing it and she would have died of no blood supply. That's where she was headed. And they knew it and she knew it. She was desperate. So she came and hit it off with my wife and began to really listen to Rhonda's approaches to diet changes. We did a workup with her, and she followed through with it. And Rhonda told you the story this morning that she recovered fully to this day, fully. Why? She sustained the same style of life that got her well. Those are two extremes. I've seen this in thousands of cases over the decades. Please know it to be true. The diet and lifestyle that got you well will keep you well. Because you have a physiology of remembrance of where you used to be. You don't want to go back there. So what you start now, sustain, please. So you're going to choose your motive. The motive is either fear or love. Now most people live bouncing back and forth between those two limits. They go, okay, I feel bad enough, I better get with it and do what I used to do to get well. Ah, I feel great again, I can reward myself, I'm going to go back down. And most people bounce back and forth between those two limits of pain and fear and complacency. They do not go past that to break through that to optimize their health. We get lazy, we get complacent. We think that's good enough. So here's my question to you. How much sin is acceptable in heaven? I rest my case. How much love is too much? No limit. So, do not carry with you into the domain of love that which is not of love. Let love be your guide toward the Father and the Son. Let love toward God be your guide. Let it be your motivation. Have you ever thought about that? Lord, I want to be used of you. Live the life you want me to live through me that I can represent you to the people that I witness to, especially my own family. If you can't witness to your own family, your wife and children, you're a hypocrite. If you're looking good to everyone else, especially at church, dressed up and your duds and whatever, and you go back home and you scream and you yell and you kick the dog and you watch television and drink your can of beer, who knows what you do, okay? It's hypocrisy. You're an actor. These are strong words. I'm talking to myself also. We're all card-carrying members of carnality. What does the Bible say about carnality and friendship with the world? It is what? Enmity against God. What's enmity? Hatred. It is war. It's the desire to kill God. So if we're in friendship with the world, well, how are we in friendship with the world? We do the things of the world. You listen to the world's music. You watch the world's movies. You look at the world's news called propaganda. 
You eat the world's food. You follow the world's ways. That's enmity against God. Carnality, selfishness, self-righteousness, self-preservation, self-defense, self-exaltation of any kind, the mystery of iniquity, is carnality at its core. Now, do you know that that generated a false gospel in heaven? The first angel's message is what? The everlasting gospel, the true gospel, that was designed to counter all the false gospel of selfishness and pride and self-exaltation of the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness is embedded in that first angel's message. In fact, in all three angels' messages. So we're here to counter a false gospel. Wow. There's a false gospel in the world being perpetuated continually, even in the church? Yes. Who's going to counter that? We are. Who else? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Speaking his understanding, his words, his gospel, the everlasting gospel, to fear God. Have reverence and awe for the Lord. Give glory to him, that is, reflect his very character. Who else is going to give glory but those that are his? For the hour of his judgment has come. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. It will come. Do we want to be judged? Do we want to be judged? Amen. We want to be judged by our judge, Jesus. And we'll be judged according to his character as it is reflected in us as we give him the glory. That's why it's in that sequence. Fear God first, then give him the glory by reflecting his character, then acknowledge judgment. Then what comes next? Worship him that made heaven and earth to see in the fountains of waters. Worship, true worship, reverence, gratitude, awe, thanksgiving, praise. This is what's being asked of us. So I want to look at how this works in our relationships. I was asked about this yesterday, so I really am motivated to share this with you. And when we do these sequences of talks uh, in Southern Oregon, the ones most uh, attended and appreciated are the ones about relationship. So building healthy relationships in Christ. Now, this is big. This is about healing. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do what? His good pleasure. Do all things without? Uh, murmuring and complaining or disputings, grumblings, arguments. Have you ever gotten in an argument with someone you love? If you say no, you're lying. Okay? We've all been there. The Lord says, do all things without murmuring and grumbling and complaining and disputing and arguing. In the Bible, there's no argument. It's just study and receiving his word that you may be blameless and harmless. Who's blameless and harmless? Jesus. We're only blameless and harmless in him. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine his lights in the world. Are we living in a perverse and crooked nation? Oh, becoming daily more and more perverse and crooked. Are we shining lights in this nation? I pray that we are. That nation, by the way, is also your own family. I pray it's becoming healthy and you're a shining light. Now, this is interesting to me. Relational strategies are routinely expressed in our lives. They're called bonding patterns. So they're unconscious agreements between couples and families. Now, one thing I've appreciated in seeing patient after patient for decades is we're broken. Our psyches are broken. Does anybody disbelieve that? <laughs> and we're run by things inside our own brains, our own minds, our own characters that we don't even, we're not even aware of. I see this routinely. We speak and we speak unconsciously. We react. We're not even aware of what we say oftentimes. And when you learn to communicate effectively, you feed back what you're hearing and the people go, yeah, that's what I meant. They don't even realize what they're saying when they're speaking. So we're driven by this need to be right, to be in control, to preserve the self. 
So we create terribly dysfunctional dynamics that foster bickering and secrets and resentment and hurt and separation and destruction of our relationships. We've all been here. When I first got together with my wife, <clears throat> I was a baby Christian. I still am. I will be for billions of years, I suspect. But the Lord is raising me up in him, in Christ, in newness of his life. Um, and, uh, go to one thing. And I noticed things that happened in me in response to my wife as we were learning who each other was and how to be in relationship with each other. And I would stop and I'd go, oh, wait a minute, something's up. So I'd just stop and say, Lord, it's not about her, it's about me. I counsel many patients. And when they come to me, they always tell me about the other person. I said, no, 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 no. This is not about them, this is about you. If they were here, it'd be about them. But you're here, this is about you. This is your perception. So I'd say, Lord, show me what's going on inside me. The beam in my own eye, take it out, please. And he would, in prayer, show me what was going on for me. And then I'd say, okay. And I'd stop and listen and pray. Say, Lord, please forgive me of this and cleanse me of this. And he would. And then go further and go, something else is up. Here we go again. And it still happens, just less frequently. But it still goes on. So I take it to the Lord in prayer and say, okay, Lord, you're my God. The one I turn to in times of stress is my God. You're my God. I'm only going to come to you. There's no one else, nowhere else to go. Have you ever noticed that? There's nowhere else to go but to the Lord. So come to the Lord and say, Lord, heal me. Show me my sins. Cleanse me. Teach me. Now, many relationships work in a drama triangle. And there's been tons of stuff written about this, but I'm going to give you the simple concept. There's a persecutor and victim. Now, the, the, the caricature is the male is the persecutor, the female is the victim, commonly. And you'll notice there's one other part here called the rescuer. So we have roles as a persecutor and victim. The persecutor has a power over capacity. And I've seen many relationships like this, where typically the guy says, I want what I want and I want it now. And I'm going to be right no matter what. And there's never an apology given, ever, and they're going to win it every, at any expense. You ever met someone like that? Hopefully not in the mirror. The victim has a different strategy called mutualness. They believe that they can change the other person. Oh boy. Have you ever seen a relationship form where the woman says, um, I can change him. He can be the kind of person I want him to be, or vice versa. That's a recipe for disaster. As my wife counsels other kids often, you don't marry promise, you marry history. Okay? And never marry a project. I love that comment she makes to her kids. So she hears through a filter and believes the persecutor's words mean what she says they should mean. So if he says, I love you, it means he really loves me. No. He's saying, I want something from you. So I'm going to speak words that I think will move you to give me what I want. And, the, and she doesn't acknowledge that he's persecuting her. Now, here's what happens. The persecutor powers over the victim to get what he wants. She yields and yields and yields and takes it, but it, something else is building up over time. It's called what? Resentment. You know how resentment is, do, is defined? taking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's the definition of resentment. You eat the poison, you expect the other person to die. It's eating at you, and the other person could care less, not even know it. So resentment is building up in the victim, then the victim snaps, said, I've had it, and she now becomes a persecutor. Speaking harshly and strongly and setting limits and saying, enough of this, I'm going to leave. I'm out of here. I don't. And what does the, the persecutor do? Plays the victim. Says, oh no, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. I really love you. I want you back. So then her heart melts. She comes to the rescue. And the persecutor now becomes the new victim. The, the persecutor has compassion the woman who became the persecutor has compassion for the persecutor who's now the victim, comes to his rescue. 
So the original persecutor is temporarily penitent just to get what he wants. That's it. And then once the victim is appeased, things go back to where they were. And it starts all over again. And it's called the drama triangle. So I have many patients who play the drama triangle. You know what I tell them to do? Stop playing the game. It doesn't work. Somebody has to stop playing the game. Usually the persecutor will never stop playing the game. The victim can. You have options. Now, first of all, be like Christ. Forgive. Forgive the grudges and resentments that you've been holding like poison in yourself and heal. It's not about walking in the spirit and the flesh. It's about walking in the spirit, as Rhonda talked about earlier today. Walking in the spirit is huge. It's walking in Christ. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that law that frees us from the law of sin and death and allows us to live the law of the mind or the law of God. As he puts that in our minds and hearts so we can live that in his spirit. So, we're judgmental and critical classically. But the Lord is saying, no, it's oppressive. You're still playing the game. If you judge or criticize someone else for their actions, you're still being hurt by that, and you're still playing the game. You're not dead to self. I love the statement that Ellen White told a, a, a young lady who was really combative. She said, all these things hurt you because you're not dead yet. Dead men don't feel. A thousand things that you feel that bother you are only that way because you're not dead yet. But that statement, dead men don't feel, is classic in her work. Now, one other concept here. The gardener and the garden. A gardener is the male, the garden is the female. That's the Lord's role. The gardener does what? Tends to the garden. Waters it, cares for its safety, and nurtures it, puts a fence around it. And the male that plays that role has a need for significance and being valued. That's what drives men. You know what drives women? The need for security. She yields the bounty of the garden. That's what the woman's role is, to make things beautiful and lovely and exquisite. When my wife came into my life, I was a bachelor. I lived like one. And my house looked like one. <laughs> she came and rearranged it, and I thought, how did you do that? You made this look gorgeous. That's what women do. They make things beautiful in your home, aesthetic. So it brings forth fruit in the aesthetics of the garden, joy, sustenance, peace, beauty. However, now watch this carefully. If the gardener slacks in his care for the garden, and he's not nurturing and feeding the garden and isn't fed by the garden, then the garden becomes needy. The wife becomes needy and withdraws or oppressive to get needs met. Now, the guy will tend to withdraw when that happens, but the woman doesn't withdraw necessarily. She starts to nag and become overwrought and worried and pouty to get her needs met, typically by manipulation. You ever seen that happen in a relationship? Or been in one that happens like that? This is not uncommon. So the key is this. Don't look to each other to be your God. Look to the Lord to be your God. A guy wants to be valued and significant. Look to the Lord for that. We're valued and significant in the Lord. Don't look to your wife for that. Look to the Lord. If the wife wants to feel secure, don't look to your husband. Look to Jesus. When you both look to Jesus, you can come to each other whole in Christ, not needy in self. Then a relationship can begin to thrive and become what the Lord would have it be, representing his love to the world in that relationship. In Ephesians chapter 5, remember, it talks about relationships of marriage. But then Paul tells us, I'm telling you a mystery. It's really between Christ and the church. We are his bride. The church is his bride. The first fruits of the bride is 144,000, representing his perfect character. And the whole church is his bride in heaven. As his bride, 
were worthy of his name. His name is his character. The bride receives the impress of his very character, of his law in her heart and mind. That's us. So we look to our husband, Jesus, only. We bring that connection back to our temporal relationships and then they can thrive. Good. So let me go to one other place here. Ah, this last piece. About successful couples. I so appreciate this. Successful couples love telling the story of how they met. Rekindles that spark. Now, how do we overcome two things? The word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb. The word of our testimony is significant. It's telling the world how we met Jesus. That love relationship forms when we met Christ. And that reminder is continually there in our hearts. Every time I, I speak by testimony, I'm reminded in gratitude of how the Lord plucked me as a brand from the fire and brought me to him. And that love grows each time I speak that story. Also, in a healthy relationship, get this, every one negative interaction is always followed by five positive interactions. Not the other way around. That's called bickering. Every one negative, five positive so if you have to count on a scorecard, that's fine to begin to learn that. But I want you to begin to appreciate if there's a negative interaction, stop. Pray. And allow positive interactions to begin to form legitimately from your heart. Give. Now my wife gives an awesome seminar on relationships. And that's how we met. Around our, mutual, our different kinds of... of um, courses around that. And she makes a beautiful comment in her courses that I've really come to appreciate. If someone's hurting you, what's the tendency? I want to run. However, have you ever imagined coming toward them with the love of God? Would that be hard to do? What would be afraid of? Being rejected? Tormented again? No. Come back to them with the love of God and watch what happens. That will change their heart. When I'm in a situation of conflict and I stop and I pray, the other person's heart changes. If I come to them with the love of God, their heart changes. Their relationship changes. It heals every time. Successful relationships are built on mutual understanding. Now, this is important. Each matters equally. So many relationships, the wife says, I don't matter. Okay? Healthy relationships, each matters. Demonstrating that becomes important. So each, pa each partner genuinely cares for and about the other person and their feelings and has an attitude of mutual acceptance and respect. Now, that's big. It's not about changing the other person. It's about changing yourself by taking that beam out of yourself. It's about coming to Christ. Have you ever shown the love of God to your partner, to your wife, your husband, your children? I mean, genuinely shown them the love of God when you didn't want to, when you felt that things were off, and you felt put off, realizing that being put off is something inside you being triggered. How do people put it? You're pointing the finger, and how many pointing back? You know, three times as many. And so... Look here, resolve the connection with the Lord here, and then come toward the other person. And they will feel that, they will notice that, they will respond to that. So each person, each person per, partner is valuable in Christ and is committed to ensuring that the other treats them well. Now that's, that's a key part. We teach our partners how to be with us. If you let things go and you allow bad behavior to be developed, it will continue. But you can train the other person about how to speak with you, how to be kind, how to be good-hearted, by treating them the same way. Give what you want to receive. And it's more blessed to keep giving. And as you give and you show them the love of God, they start kindling that in themselves. That's how we learn 
to be in healthy relationships as we're treated that way by our partners. So I'm going to finish with these few points. Never contend for the right, for your own rights. Esteem your partner greater than yourself. Wow. Can you imagine doing that? Giving them more than you want to give to yourself. In a problem area, someone has to be heard first. You ever notice two people talking and no one's listening? Stop talking. So I told one patient, zip it. And he was bickering with his wife. And he looked at me and he started to smile and nod. And the wife was going, somebody has to stop talking and listen. When you listen, feedback what you heard. You can't be heard until you've listened first. The person talking that's got the bigger issue can't hear you till they've been heard. So stop first and listen. How does James put it? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Powerful statement. Slow to speak, swift to hear. Listen first before you speak. Listen to the other person's heart. Contact what they've said, what they've meant, what they want, what they feel. And when you hear that, they go, ah, oh, I've been heard. And they start telling you what's really on their heart that they didn't even know themselves that you've helped them connect with. And when they felt heard, then you can speak. What you dislike in your partner is equally an issue in yourself, as we described. If you don't see it or own it, just ask your partner. Everywhere we go, we're, we're transparent. Everyone sees our issues except us. If you really want to know what's going on, ask your partner. Ask in earnest, and they'll be able to tell you. Because they live with you. They see it all. Don't be afraid. It's a great conversation to have but be open to listening and take that to heart to, the, to Jesus. Don't depend on your wife or your husband to be your therapist. Too often people attempt that and fail miserably. Come to Christ. He's your counselor. His spirit is your counselor. Only your divine creator is your God and source of love, not your partner or your spouse. Neither of you are the other person's God. My wife calls it, I love it, she calls it co-idolatry. We call it codependence. She's called it co-idolatry. I really respect that statement. We make idols out of each other. We make the other person God. I was counseling a young man just recently who was in a broken relationship. He had made his previous partner his God. She had to disappoint him. She couldn't be his God. If someone tries to make you your God, leave, your God, leave them to the Lord. Don't play that role. Let the Lord be their God. If you're making someone else your God, that's an, worshiping an idol. And I'll finish with this, as we started yesterday, about the law of life, law of service, law of love. Everything in nature that's healthy takes only to give for the benefit of the whole, as in nature, so in our bodies and our relationships. If our relationships are healthy and whole, we're here to give God's love. We receive it from him just to give that to our partners and our families and our larger family. So it's more blessed to give than to receive, and this is the desire I have for each one of you. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to be here in the morning at 10 o'clock, I believe it is. And I've done this with many groups in Southern Oregon. We used to get here every month and do things like this. It was just, I'm available to ask questions about. What it? It's called Ask the Doctor or something like that. And any question you have about health, healing, personal, family, whatever, ask. I love it because it's just like being with patients all day. Things come in in ways you don't know what to expect. I don't even look at my schedule for the day. I just see who's next and then go from there. And it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's truly a delight for me to do that. That's why I can't retire. I love this stuff too much. And I love studying and learning and supporting people in their healing. So you're welcome to join us tomorrow. Ask whatever questions you want. 
And I love doing it this way because I use that as an opportunity for teaching, that you understand how your body works and how you can begin to approach healing and how we approach that process from a natural healthcare perspective. Remember, we're wanting to reestablish clear understanding of natural health care and the Advent movement and connect it to the gospel. That's what this was founded to do. I pray that we start to doing that in the churches, that you become truly medical missionaries in your homes, in your churches, in your families, in this community. It needs it. The world requires it, that you show them the love of God and his healing that he will do in them. So I'd like to end with a moment of prayer, if you'll mind. So please join me, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for your gift of love, your gift of faith, your gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you have made it clear to us the message you would have us give to the world, the message of healing, the right arm of the gospel, that the righteousness by faith may become each of ours as our bodies are cleansed, our brains are cleansed, and we can understand the message, hear the messages of heaven, and speak them to the world. Use us, Lord. Prepare us to be medical missionaries to the world, to take the gospel and the three angels' messages to this needful world that you may come and retrieve your own. For I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.